husband Allah and Nikm al Wakil Nikm al Mawla and Nikm al Nasir, Aoudu billahi min al Shaytan al Laeem al Rajeem. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al Anbiya wal Mursaleen. Sayyidina wa Mawlana Abil Qasim Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala. وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سيما بقية الله العظم روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي Pain is a real part of our life we all go through suffering, every human being. No one is excluded from pain and suffering. This is the reality of life and we are going through it. And we are told to deal with pain, to deal with the sufferings and the stress that we have been given. The problems in life can come from any place and any angle. We don't know where they come from, but they will come and you can see it all around you. Everyone in your life is going through sufferings. They are going through stress. People have to deal with it. And truly, if a person doesn't know how to deal with it, then these sufferings that he goes through and the stress that he has in life overwhelms him and starts to destroy him and eventually destroy his fate and at the end he blames Allah for all the misgivings in his life. Many people end up to be cynical and negative in life because they weren't able to deal with the pain that they're going through. They end up being negative towards Allah and blame Allah for it. And say that Allah, you know, really, why did you do this to me? And you'll see that in many people around you. They lose hope in du'as, they lose hope in forgiveness, they lose hope that Allah is going to be merciful towards them. They don't even understand. The reason is because they never learn to deal with the pain that they're going through. And that's what we want to learn. How do you deal with this pain in our life? How do you deal with sufferings in our life? The problems that we are going in life. And as youngsters, I'm sure you're not going through a lot of real pain. You know, the only pain that you're going through is that not being old enough to enjoy the good rides at the amusement park, you know. And that's the only pain you have. But other than that, you know, really it's not a big deal. But as you grow, the pain and suffering starts to accumulate. And that's when you start growing old and you'll see it in your elders, you'll see it in your parents, you'll see it in everyone around you. So that's why we need to know how to deal with pain. You know, what happens with pain? Why should we try to get rid of pain in our life? Why should we try to solve sufferings in our life? Well, here's what happens. If you don't solve the suffering in your life, you know what it does to you? It will eventually make you lose your faith. I'm not saying this. It's Imam Ali alayhi salam. Who said it? He said that if you, right, he said that poverty, poverty that's constant will lead to kufr, will lead to disbelief. Poverty is a kind of pain, it's a kind of suffering. And if you let this suffering continue, if you're constantly in this state, you will see that, you, that it will lead to you disbelieving, doing wrong, losing your faith. And that's why it's so important for us to deal with pain and to get rid of it. We are told and we are encouraged in Islam to try to alleviate the pain that we are in. Don't accept it. Don't submit to it. You know it's there. You got to deal with it now. You got to, you know, uh, know how to manage it. You know how to control it. And eventually overcome it. 
So it's really important that we do that. What happens if you let this suffering that you're going through continue? So I'm going to give you some logical step, things that will happen. And you can just look in your life as to if that is the case that is with you or people around you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, you know, uh, what happens when you, for example, are going through a suffering? Let's say cancer, disease, family loss, uh, things have been stolen from you, uh, you losing your job, poverty, anything that is a suffering, a pain. Relationships that are bad, hurtful, harmful, anything that you're going through. What happens if you do not get rid of the pain? You see, whenever you're in pain, look at yourself. Let's say, for example, if you have a thorn that's stuck in your foot, if you have a thorn that's stuck in your foot, what happens? There's certain things that happen to you in your psychology. I mean, really, this is natural results of it. Number one thing, you will be hasty in making decisions. You know, when you're in pain, then the number one thing is, that how do I get rid of it? I don't care how. By hook or crook, please get rid of it. I am poor right now. I need something. By hook and crook, I need to get something done. You resort to wrong, it doesn't matter for you. It just happens. Why? Because you make hasty decisions. You become hasty. You're in pain right now. The only thing that you can think of is that how can I get rid of this pain? Second thing that happens to you, you become impulsive. You'll see it. You become impulsive. The first choice that you have, you will take it. You won't wait for the best choice, you will just take whatever comes in front of you. If you were relaxed, if you were not in pain, if you had a peace of mind, then you would think, is this the best choice for me? No, it does happen. A lot of people get married like this. It's impulsive. They're so desperate that anyone who comes along, I mean, you know, I asked one brother, you know, so what's the right girl that you're looking for? Just someone who says yes. <laughs> Great, you know. I mean, really, if you're that much in pain and you're going through suffering, maybe you shouldn't be making this decision. But it happens when you are suffering, you make impulsive decisions. It might not be the best choice for you. It might not be the right thing for you, but you do it. The third thing that happens when you are in pain or suffering, People, when they're in pain, resort to superstition. You'll see that. They resort to superstition. Right? When they're in pain, you know, and that pain is not going away, then, you know, they'll be like, whatever, you know. Uh, if there's a magician out there, if there's a soothsayer out there, let me go to him. Some Baba that's on English TV, you know. And you call them up and say, can you help me? You go to a psychic. You know, hiding from others. Because if people see you from IAC, they'll be like, what are you doing at a psychic, you know? But it happens. You go and you resort to superstition. Why are you doing this? Because of pain. If you were in pain, if you aren't in suffering, then you wouldn't do that. You will see people blame each other based on this. I've heard so many times, you know, I think my relatives, you know, I have this aunt, I think she's my enemy, and she's doing magic on me. <laughs> and you hear it all the time. And, like, why are you even resorting that? Why can't you just, for example, say that maybe Allah is doing this to me? But why would Allah do that to me? That's a good question to answer. Maybe we should try to find why Allah is doing it instead of why my khala is doing it. <laughs> Really, we need to find that out before we go somewhere else. Because really, that's what happens. We resort to superstition. This happens because of pain. Fourth thing that happens because of pain that you will see in your life is a buildup of anger. You become angry. You, uh, your fuse is short. You become snappy. You snap all the time. You can't deal with it. If you are at peace of mind, you'll see your kids can make as much noise as they can. It's okay. You're okay with it. You love hearing them shout. But when you are in pain or suffering or in, under stress, 
even a little noise, that's it. You can't tolerate it. Why is that happening? Because of suffering. It is making you a person who is hot-tempered. So this is a natural result of pain. And Allah doesn't want us to go on in pain. He, he, that's not what Allah said. You see, Allah encouraged us to get rid of this pain. The reason why you are becoming a bad person. Get rid of that reason. And that's what pain causes us. Fifth thing that pain causes, and I'm giving these five points to you that you can look at yourself and see. When you are going through any sort of suffering in life, you'll see yourself going through these things. The fifth thing that happens to a person who's going through suffering is loss of morality. You lose your moral compass. You lose your moral compass. You stop doing wrong things. You start resorting to wrong things. Talking bad about other people. Making up stories about other people. Saying wrong things. Doing haram things. That's what happens when you, for example, don't have a job for too long and you never look for it and now you can feel that, you know what, if I don't pay my rent next month, I'm on the street, what happens? I will just uh, take any haram thing, whatever it can be, you know. You end up buying lottery tickets. That's what happens. You buy lottery tickets hoping that this is going to make me get out of this. You start resorting to haram. Why are you doing this? Because of pain. And you did not make the effort to get rid of it or to alleviate it. This is the problem. When we do not know how to deal with pain, that's when we have the problem. So what we want to do is learn how to deal with pain. Not just deal with it, but how to manage pain. So the subject of these three days is pain management. And how do we manage pain in our life and the sufferings that we are going through? I said one thing yesterday, one of the ways to deal with pain in life is knowing that it's going to happen. We talked about it yesterday that if you know that pain is going to happen in your life and that you're going to get stressed and that you're going to go through sufferings, then you will be expecting it. And when you expect it, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. For example, if you were told you know, at breakfast time, hey, at lunch time, you're going to get into an accident. You're expecting it. Let me see where it's coming from. Right? So, there you go. You know, you will see that. If it happens, oh, there it is. You won't be like, oh my God. You won't be like that. You'll just be like, oh, there it is. You know, it's going to happen. If you know that you're going to get cancer or a disease, you know, Hey, you know what? When you are 50 years old, you're going to get this cancer. There it is. You know, so what happened? When it happens, good. You know, it happened. You're expecting it. But when you don't expect it, the shock is going to kill you first. And you're so upset that it happened to you because you weren't accept expecting it. That's why death is so hard for people. They never expected it. I don't know why everyone is going to die. So why weren't you expecting it? When it comes that, oh no, not me, you know, and by the time you say that, you're gone. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. When you look at suffering coming to you, most people, when they look at death, you know, they're so scared. It's as if they weren't expecting it. They are depressed, and you know, like they see that, and they're depressed about it. Most people, when they have suffering in their life, if you look at their face, they have more shock than anything else. Look at their eyes like, why died? What happened to me? What? You weren't expecting it to happen? Why not? You know, the face that they have when they see a pain or a suffering is the same face that Americans have when they elected Donald Trump. <laughs> They're in a state of shock. What happened? You know? And you look at that, it, why? <laughs> what do you expect? This problem's gonna come, and you don't know where it's gonna come from. Say, so here it is, deal with it now. You gotta deal with it, and the number one thing for pain is knowing that it's gonna happen, everyone. That's the first thing. The second way to deal with pain that I'm gonna to mention today is that one of the ways that you can truly alleviate pain and reduce the pain and the suffering and the stress in your life is by knowing why Allah is doing this to you. 
Why is he giving you this pain? Would it help if you know that why this is happening? Not it's going to happen. You know it's happening. But why does it happen? Knowing the philosophy of pain is a major factor in dealing with it. Why does it happen? You will, you know, it will be so good for you to deal with it, knowing that it's the case. And you will be able to deal with the pain and manage it. And reach a state of comfort and peace in your, in your life. So let's understand why do we go through pain? You know, there is a there is a reality behind it, a real reason why Allah gives us pain. And I'm not talking about the pain that we inflict on ourselves. No, that's not the pain I'm talking about. I'm talking about the pain that you are going to get in life. Why do you get pain in your life? There is an actual reason for it, and there are other wisdoms behind it. So what I'm Debating is what, what should I say first? The real reason first? Or you know, just go through the, some of the wisdoms first? Right? So, looking at you, I'll just give you the real reason. And then I'll give you the other wisdoms that why a life gives us pain. Alright? The real reason why you have pain in your life. Do you want to know why? Yes. Very good. <laughs> we got a definite yes. <laughs> so, if you want that, let's sound out a loud salawat. Okay, uh, with one one more salawat, let's move forward here and display there. Are people in the back looking inside and running away, you know? Yeah, let's go. All these guys move over here. We've got lots of space over here. So that's good, you know? At least I can see you. Very good. Now, for the love of Fatima, one more salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. All right, my friends, you know why we go through pain? Why Allah gives us pain? The reason Allah gives us pain is because we are human beings. We are insan. It is part of being insan. The reason Allah makes us go through sufferings is because we are human beings. We are not animals. We are not uh, cattle. We are not camels. We are not dogs. We are not cats. We are not rocks. We are not trees. We are human beings. Being a human, pain comes with it. That's it. The real reason you go through pain is because human. The only way you can get rid of it is if you want to become a rock. And then, you know, we'll keep you somewhere and you can just lie there until the wind blows you. Right? Until then, you know, you can do that. But if you want to be a human being, then you have to go through pain. And obviously, I see wide eyes. It means that you didn't understand. I know that. I'm going to explain that to you. You know, there, we are different than every other creature. You know why? Because we have the ability to grow. We can develop. We can become greater. We can adopt virtues. We can abstain from doing wrong. Other animals can't do that. Other things can't do that. We, Allah gave us the capacity to grow. Growth is being a human being, we grow. No one else can grow. No animal can grow. You can teach a dog some tricks, but that doesn't make him a better dog than others. It doesn't. You know, it's still a dog. You know, uh, when you look at it, that's what it is. We are the only ones that can grow. And you know what happens when you grow? Why do you grow? The basis of our growth, the reason that we grow is because we can make choices. In order for us, Allah, in order for us to grow, He gave us free will. He gave us the ability to choose. Really. We have the ability to choose. Animals don't have the ability to choose. You know, we have the ability to choose. 
And we need to understand now what this choice is. I want you to understand it. What is choice? Because most people don't know what choice is, and that's why they're so confused when they speak about free will and choice. Choice, my friends, really, where does choice come in? If you have one thing in front of you and being offered to you, nothing else, if you just have one thing being offered to you, is that a choice? Right there, I mean, I, it's water. Either you take it or lose it. So you're going to take it. It's not a choice. Let's say, for example, there's only one brand of cereal. That's it, cornflakes. When you go to the aisle, the food aisle, the cereal aisle, all you see is cornflakes. And that's too generic. My son say it all the time. Now, why are you bringing this cereal? <laughs> you know, it doesn't taste good. In the food aisle, in the cereal aisle, you see only one cereal, one brand of cereal, cornflakes, and that's it. From here to there. Then what happened? Is that a choice? No, I'll just take that and put it in the basket and that's it. I buy it. I don't have any choice. So at least when we go to a grocery store, when you go to Kroger's and we see different cereals there, then you know probably you're like, oh, thank God we're not communist. <laughs> and we have choice. But again, if you are offered one thing, you don't have a choice. Like for example, animals don't have a choice. Cows don't have a choice. Allah didn't give them a choice between uh, grass and uh, uh, steaks. <laughs> Although that would be really bad eating yourself. What right? <laughs> did I say chicken? Still, the cows will, they don't eat that. They just eat grass. And you know what? They'll just keep on eating grass and they don't complain. Have you ever seen a cow complain? <laughs> cows don't complain. Sheep don't complain. The reason they don't complain is because they have no choice. They only know one thing and that's what they do. If you were made like that, you wouldn't complain also. You will just go on. If the only thing you need is unleaded gasoline, then you know what? That's all you need. Everywhere you go, unleaded gasoline. That's it. But what happened is that you are not like that. Because Allah gave you choice. Now what is choice? Let's say, I'm going to explain this logically, right? Let's say, for example, if you are offered one thing that you like and one thing that you don't like, right? For example, kids are offered, okay, two things, right? They're offered broccoli and pizza. What would they choose? Broccoli. 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 Pizza, right? Broccoli. Just be honest. <laughs> Give the right answer. I've been taught in a hadith school, you know? <laughs> you know, and that's it. I mean, people, they're going to choose pizza all the time. They're not going to choose the spinach, you know? <coughs> And you can tell them all the much not eat the spinach also, eat your fruits, eat your vegetables, you know, they'll be like, sure, you know, and they eat the pizza. <laughs> it shows that they will always eat pizza no matter how many times you give it to them. If you like chai and you don't like coffee, no. If I offer you chai and coffee, what are you gonna choose? Chai. Chai. Gonna choose you like chai. chai. You are gonna choose chai. If I offer you ten times, you will choose chai. If I offer you a hundred times, you will choose chai. Why? Because I like this, I don't like that. Finish. If you are given two things to choose from, one which you like, one which you don't like, then it's not a choice. You will always do what you like. Where does choice come into play? What if there are two things that you don't like? And it's the same for you. Chai and coffee. I don't like chai, I don't like coffee, but those are the only two choices I have. So now, is this a choice? It's random, right? Whatever. Give me whatever. It doesn't matter. Because I don't like both of them. What happens here? There is no choice. My friends, tell me, where does choice come into play? When you don't like two things, there's no choice. When you like one thing over another, there's no choice. 
My friends, the only place choice comes into play is where? When you like two things. And both of them are offered to you that you can only choose one. You like both. I like chai and I like coffee. I like both of them. Now when the choice is given, when this offer is being given to you of two things that you like, then you have a choice. Then you actually have a choice. And you know what happens when you choose? Tell me what happens when you choose. Let's say I choose anything. I, I like both of them. So when I choose chai, let's say I choose chai, what happens? I have to lose the coffee. When you separate yourself and lose something that you like, then pain is natural. Pain is the natural result of choice. When you have choice and you choose one thing over another that you like, now you have to separate from that thing which you like, there's pain of losing it. There's pain. The stress. My friends, we are human beings. Allah gave us choice. Choice results in pain. So that's why you are a human being. Pain is a natural part of you. Because of the choices that you make. Now I wish I could have everything in the buffet. I like all of them, but I can't. You know, I really can't. And not being able to take what I like. I feel distressed. I feel Sad. My friends, this is it. This is why pain happens in life. The natural reason for suffering and pain in our life is because we have the ability to choose. We made the choices in life and that choice that we made. You know, I married one lady, but I had to let go of all the others. Hey. So now what happens? I mean, it's choice. We made a choice. You know? We made a choice in life. When you make choices, you have to let go of things that you like, that you love. And when you do that, pain is going to happen. The greater, that's why, you know, when, when, when you look at how Imam Ali explains this, that's what it is. He says, why are you in pain? Why are you in suffering? It's because that's how Allah created you. Allah created you different from each other. In a variety. Everyone is different from one another. And hence, all these things that you like, all these variety that you have, you can't have everything. You can only choose one. When you choose one, you have to let go of the others. You have to let go of the others and there's pain. This is it, my friends. And this is where it happens. I mean, Allah's system is beautiful. When Allah wants to give you pain, you see, He knows what He's doing. He plays around with us, He gives us pain, and He wants us to get out of it. You know? Really. You know, when do, for example, I'm looking at Allah's system, I'm telling you, you know? Uh, you know, um, boys and girls become baligh at what age? Well, you know that, uh, from 9 to 15, right? 9 years ago, whatever it is, 9 to 15, right? They become balik at this age. You know the age that they become balik, you know? Tell me. Now, when they become balik, and they become, they reach adolescence, and they go through that period, are they ready for marriage? No. They're not, right? They're still immature, they aren't ready, they don't know what it means, they don't know what relationships mean, they're not mature enough, they are irresponsible. But Allah, you gave them the hormones when they are this age. Why can't you just delay it for five, six years? Everything will be perfect then. Because now that you gave it to them, it's the problem of us, the parents, who have to deal with it. 
We have to deal with this mess for the whole five, six, seven, eight years when they're growing up. If you had just delayed their growth by seven, eight years, everything would be so perfect that they'll be mature and violent at the same time and they get married. Allah is saying, you know what? That's your problem. <laughs> he said, it's between this age when they become violent and when they become mature enough to actually carry out their duties is where their growth is going to take place. This is where tarbiyat is going to happen. If it wasn't for this, where would tarbiyat happen? Tarbiyat requires pain. It requires suffering. And if you don't give that suffering, you can't grow. It's in this element, this raging battlefield, of them becoming bonded at this age and mature at this age is where you now have to guide them and help them to grow. <coughs> and this is where they are going to become a believer. At this age. My friends, this is Allah's system. And you look at Allah's system, you know, He knew what He was doing. And that's why it's important for us to understand how Allah created us. When He has made us a human being, it means He gave us the ability to grow. How do we grow? By making choices. When we make choices, we are letting go of things that we love and like and are attached to. And when you let go of things that you are attached to, you are going to feel pain. Pain is a natural part of being a human being. And that's what it is, my friends. This is how we are going to understand. You are going to go through sufferings in life because you are choosing. And those choices that you're making. And the more attachments you have, the deeper attachments you have, the more is going to be the pain that you feel. Well, as I said, the real reason for pain is right here, like what I mentioned. That's why we feel pain. But then Allah gives us some sufferings also based on certain wisdoms. I want to say those things also so that today I just want to help you to know why sufferings happen in your life so you can deal with it and know that this is happening and you can get rid of it. You know, one other reason that suffering happens is because of divine retribution. Divine retribution. Allah doesn't send azab in this dunya. Azab is meant for akhirah, chastisement is meant for akhirah, not here. Neither does Allah give you reward here, nor does He give you chastisement here. He's not going to give you that because this world is too little for punishment. And this world is too little for reward. When you do something wrong and you bad and you're evil, you know what Allah is saying, hey listen, uh, there's nothing here I can do to you that fits your crime. So, in order to whoop you, you got to come there. You know, I got a good whooping for you there. And then reward is the same thing. You did something good, you are a good person, and I want to reward you, but you know, there's nothing I can give you in this world that can reward you. So, I'm going to wait till you come there to actually give you a reward that's meant for you. Nothing here is that. So here, when you say divine retribution, it's not a punishment. It's more like a slap in the wrist. Right? It's more like a slap in the wrist. But how does Allah do that? You know, story of Yusuf and his brothers. Sure, you heard that story, right? About Yusuf and his brothers, how the brothers threw Yusuf in the well, and they left him there to die. But did he die? No. He was saved, but then he was sold as a slave, and then he lived as a slave, and then grew up there, and after that, was, then went to jail, spent time in jail, and all these things he went to life, but at the end he became the Prime Minister of Egypt. Very powerful role. Became, right? Now, after all of that, right, the brothers came and they met him and, you know, you know, they all like hugged each other and you know, everything was fine. This is one of those stories that has a happy ending in the Quran, you know. And so everyone started living all happy and you know, lovely and great. But then what happened is that these kids went to their father, Yahoo, and said, Father, what happened? I mean, we did something wrong to Yusuf. Why didn't Allah punish us? 
Why did Allah do something to us when we did something such horrible to Yusuf? So Yaqub asked Allah, he says, Allah, why didn't you punish them? So Allah, he gave a very short reply and said, I already punished them. And I said, but what? What punishment did we get? We didn't get any punishment. I mean, we lived our lives. We got married, we had children, we were together, we were lived as family and everything. It's Yusuf who seemed to have punishment, right? He was a slave, he went to jail, he went through all kinds of difficulties in life. What is the punishment that you gave us? So Yaku was like, well, that's interesting. Let me ask Allah. So he asked Allah, Allah, you know what I mean? These, my sons, really, where was the punishment? They didn't see the punishment coming and what was that? Where was the punishment that you sent? So Allah replied back and he said to Yaqub, he says, go and tell them that what greater punishment there is in this world that I've taken away from them the pleasure of my ibadat. Now they will enjoy three hours of football, but they will not enjoy two minutes of prayer. They will not enjoy two minutes of prayer. It will be hard for them. Two minutes of prayer. But they will watch a movie for two hours without anything. But they will not be able to read Quran for five minutes. Why is that? Divine retribution. Some things we have done wrong in our life. That Allah is saying, you know what? I will occupy your time. And I will occupy you with problems in such a way that you don't have time for me. That you don't have time for me. That's what I'll do. So one of the reasons that punishments happen, I mean, I mean problems happen in our life, maybe a lie is he doesn't want us because of the wrongs we have done. In order to rectify that, we have to go back and see the wrongs we have done and straighten them out. We need to straighten those out. Clear them up and say, man, you know what, let me think about it. Let me see where I did something wrong to someone and then go back there and start to do at least something right. That's what we need to be doing. One of the reasons why this happens, my friends, is retribution. Beware of that. Don't be afraid of that. All right, I'm just mentioning reasons. I, I can explain this a lot, but I don't want to. I'm just giving you the reasons why Allah sends down problems in our lives. And third reason I'm giving you today, the philosophy of why we have problems. Third reason, and this will be the last for tonight. Right? Third reason why we go through problems in life. You know, one of the reasons why Allah gives us problems and suffering in life is to rectify our shortcomings. To make them better. You know, we all have shortcomings. But we don't want to admit it. Do you know how we admit shortcomings? How do we say that we have shortcomings and we have failures? You know, we say that everyone has shortcomings. No, you have shortcomings. And I know everyone, no, 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 say I have shortcomings. But we don't want to say I. Even when we want to admit that we, I have shortcomings, we want to say everyone has shortcomings. Why are you saying everyone for? Just say you. You are the problem. It's hard. It's hard to point the finger at us. You see, we all have one shortcoming that every one of us has. You know, we all have one shortcoming that we all share in. You know what that is? That is our ego. We all have an ego. Where does this ego come from? Have you ever noticed why we have this ego? I mean, it's natural. It's natural for you to have ego. It's not wrong, it's natural for you to have ego. The reason that we naturally have an ego is because Allah, the way Allah created us. I mean, Allah created us the best, right? I said, you know, you, know, you are the best creation. Ashraful makhlukat. There you are. Allah, you created me the best, better than a dog and a cat. You know, when I look at a mutt or a dog, you know, I look at him, <laughs> look at that dog. Dumb. <laughs> he is. I'm better than him. 
Allah, Allah says that himself, Ashraful Makhlukat. So when you have been created better than others, like for example, you are a Lamborghini and the dog, you know, he's that little uh, hand car you get, a dune buggy, you know? Whatever it is, right? You see that, and you see a Lamborghini, of course you are going to say that, well, you know, I mean, look at me, I'm, I, I'm better. Allah, you created me better. And what happens? It goes to our head. Admit it, it goes to our head. When we, for example, see someone dumb, a honey boo boo, you know, and you look at that and say, ha ha ha, huh. you know, why are you feeling better? Because you look at them and you feel dumb, you know? I mean, man, you feel better when you see someone who's dumb, you know? Maybe that's why Americans like Donald Trump. <laughs> he makes them feel better about themselves. <laughs> you know, one president did that. Obama made us feel bad. You know, I <laughs> swear, intelligent, I me, mean, dumb, you know. No, it's the other way around now. I feel smarter. <laughs> I mean, I go to sleep. So, what happens when you look at someone who's like that? Really, that's how it comes out. And so, when Allah created us better than everyone else, it's natural for us to have an ego. Listen to Salawats. So now what happens is that when he made us like that, it is natural for us to get an ego. To make our heads blow it. That's what happens. We think that we are better. So now Allah has to make a way for us to come down to reality and know that, listen, we are not all that great. You know, now Allah has done that in certain ways. Right? And one of the ways that he does it is by giving us problems. By giving us suffering. When we go through certain suffering, then we start to realize ourselves. If we just pay attention to it. If we pay attention to it, really. The reason Allah gave us those problems in life is because he wants us to realize who we are so that we don't have an ego. And the philosophy behind many of these things leads to that. Ego is something that is every day, it can happen any moment. So how does Allah help you to get over it? You know what he did to you? He gave you a problem. He made you go to the bathroom. That's the philosophy behind why you go to the bathroom. Do you realize what Allah has made you do? I mean, you, the best of creation, is in a situation that you can't even talk about in front of others. That is disgusting. Allah, why are you doing this to me? Because I want you to realize, don't get a big head. Who are you? My friends, yeah, Allah is not kidding around, is he? He's not. That's how he teaches you. Don't get a big head, you know? And then, you know, if you realize that and become a Muslim and say, SubhanAllah, you know what, I'm going to pray to Allah, you know, good. Now, uh, you are a believer, so now what happens? You know, then you get another big head because I am a mu'min. And mu'mineen get another big head, right? They don't get the big head that the kuffar do because the kuffar get a big head thing this night. Allah sends them to the bathroom, you know? Hey, listen, go there and find out who you are, right? But then, when you, are, when you become a Muslim and start to worship Allah, now you get a big head saying that, I pray, I fast, I'm better than others, you know? You get that big head, right? So Allah said, you know what? You know there's another way. I'm going to give you a trouble and I'm going to give you a problem right now. What is that? He says, go and make sajda. You know, one of the ways that you get rid of ego is by making sajda. Yeah. By prostrating before Allah. That's how you get rid of ego. But not the way you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, subhanAllah. Just make sajda, right? No, not that. You know, because when we make sajda, we are looking at our head. Allah is saying, no. When you make sajda, look at your backside. Look at the disgusting posture you're in. And this is what I made you do. Look at yourself. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of us we are thinking like, oh, my head's on the ground. No, no, look what your head is. Really. Understand this, my friends, how Allah is destroying your ego. If you just pay attention to what's going on, when you make sajda, then you'll realize, Allah, what did you make me do? What did you make me do? Me, the best creation, I have this family, I come from this background, I'm a mu'min, I'm, I'm the president of this center, and blah, 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 and here I am doing this. Really, it's something that Allah knows when He gives you a problem, why He's giving it to you. Deal with it. That's how you bring it down. Problems, they come, we need to know why they come in order to deal with them. Sufferings Allah makes us go through so that we can look at those sufferings and see, wow, is this the reason why I'm suffering? Yes. Many of these things, when we start to pay attention to and think about it, my friends. Because you know what? If we don't deal with the sufferings, then we lose our humanity. We don't, if we don't deal with the hardships we have, we lose our humanity until we become so low and so despicable that no matter what kind of grievous crimes we do, it won't matter. Really, it won't matter. You know, it really won't matter. You know, one of the things that the people, when Imam Hussein was on the ground, and he fell to the ground, he was on a bed of arrows, and you know, Imam Hussein was in his last moments, he wanted to do sajda, he wasn't able to go into sajda because he was on arrows, so you know what he did? He pulled his weight on the arrow so he could make the arrow go through his body. You know, he can just make each and every arrow go through his body so he can reach the ground. And then as he reached the ground, no one went there. You know, no one went there to kill him. They were all taking their time. Shimr was taking his time. He didn't go close to Imam Hussein. He said, wait, wait. He said, he asked everyone to wait, wait. And you know what they're waiting for? They were waiting for enough blood to go out of the body of Imam Hussain so he doesn't have power to defend himself. You know, that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for Imam Hussain so that he can lose blood so that whatever they do, he can't do anything about it. You know, when they want to get close, Sh Shimmer said, wait, wait, you know what? Let me see if he has the power to get up or not. You know what he did? Let me tell you what he did. He said, let me, he went close so that Hussein can hear what he's saying, and then he made a, an order, a command saying, go and grab the woman of Hussein. <laughs> Just to see if Hussein raises his head. When he saw that Hussein didn't raise his head, he said it's time to go and kill him. <laughs> because he knew that Hussein no matter what happens, if he has even an ounce of energy in him, if he hears that his women are being hurt, that he would get up. <laughs> they knew that Hussein has self-respect and dignity. They knew that. I mean, these scoundrels, that's what they were doing. That's why you see when Hussein wasn't able to get up a group of, ca one cavalry, it was about 10 to 12 soldiers on horses. A cavalry unit. They said that when we saw that Hussein's head is being slaughtered, so we didn't want to wait. We wanted to be the first ones to reach the tents and steal whatever we can and get whatever we can. So we, all of us, started riding our horses fast. We went there fast to the, all the way to the tents. And we drove and we rode our horses so fast that we saw that as we approached the tents, we saw the tents, we saw children coming out of one of the tents and all of them scrambling on the ground. As they went all through the ground, they saw us coming. They saw us coming with such fierce force that they got scared and they all ran back into the tent. 
They all ran back into the tent, except for one kid. He was petrified. He was looking at us. His eyes were wide. He was petrified. He could not move forward. He could not move backward. He was just so scared that he wasn't able to do anything. And one of our soldiers got off the horse, took out his sword, and with one swipe of the sword, cut that kid in half. Why did you do that for? It's just a kid. It's a four-year-old kid. Why did you kill him like that? What did you get out of it? You see that they have lost their humanity. They have completely become so low that they have no moral compass at all. This is what's happening with those children there. And now it is said, it is said that one person says this, that I was late because I was on foot. I was late coming to the tents and everyone had already raided the tents and they took whatever they can from the tents. So what I did is that I came looking for something to steal and I couldn't find anything and I felt bad. I felt sad that I wasn't able to find anything. And then I saw this little girl, she was wearing earrings. So I went up to her, I went up to that little girl and I said, give me those earrings. And he went to pull those earrings. The girl said, don't touch me, don't touch me. Let them give them to you. This was a small girl, three year old. But you know what, a three year old, when that girl started to take off the earrings, her motor skills are not that good. She, she's slowly fumbling with the earrings, trying to take them off. She doesn't know how to do it. And he is losing precious time from stealing other things. So when he sees that she's taking too much time, he could not wait any longer. So he said, I took those earrings by force. Pull them off the earrings in such a way that her ears ripped open. You know, it's hard, my friends, it's hard. Let me take you now, since you're already there, let me take you now. Let me take you now to Imam Sajjad. You know, I don't want to go to Imam Sajjad, the Shahad that just passed. So let me just go there so that we can talk about Imam Sajjad. That was Imam Hussain. That when Shimmer wanted to test Imam Hussain, he called out and said, I go and grab the woman of Hussain to see if Hussain would get up. But now just imagine, when Imam Sajjad was taken as a prisoner, Imam Sajjad said, this is from Imam Bakr. Imam Bakr said that my father told me that when they took us as bayt as prisoners, they were requested. They requested, they were requested that listen, at least keep us behind. Do not keep us in the middle. They went to Shimmer also and told him that we have a request. Umme Kulsumi said, requested Shimmer. That listen, do not take us in the middle. At least keep us in the back. Have some dignity to do that. And you know what happened? That Shimmer said, all right, I will do it. And then you know what Shimmer did? Instead of keeping them in the back, he put them right in the middle of it. Everyone. He put them right in the middle of everyone and he put their hands in between them so everyone who looks at the head will also look at the woman and the children. Imam Sajjad says that our ladies were kept as a prisoners, they were kept like this. And everyone was sat on bareback. The camels, they didn't have any saddles. They put our woman on bareback saddle, on bareback camels. You know what that means? The camel has a very rough back. The, uh, the humps of the camel are very rough to drive, to ride on. And so what happened is that they put the ladies and the children on bareback camels and they would make them walk like that. If they really, how hard it is for them to go like that. And Sakina was put on one of those camels. It is said that as they were walking, as these camels were going, on the way, Sakina fell down. Sakina fell down from there. They didn't notice that Sakina is missing until they reached the next stop and they saw that the girl is missing. And Zainab, she felt that I need to go and look for her. So they let Zainab go. Zainab went looking for Sakina. She was calling out to Sakina. Sakina, where are you? Where are you? She was calling out. She couldn't hear Sakina and someone called out to Zainab and said, she's here. Sakina went to see whose voice is that and she saw a lady and Sakina was sleeping on her lap. 
Zeno went close to that lady and saw Sakina on her lap and she thanked her. But Zeno was a little bit surprised because Sakina did not have the habit of sleeping with anyone except for Hussein. She only would sleep with Imam Hussein and no one else. She said, how did this baby, how did this girl sleep with you? And the lady looked up to Zaki, looked up to Zainab and said, don't you recognize your mother Zainab? This is your mother here. How can she not sleep with me? I am the mother of Hussein. When Zainab came back, she came back with Sakina, she told the soldiers, she told the soldiers, listen, let me keep this girl, let me be with her. The soldiers said, no, don't worry, we have a plan for her. You can go on your camel. They forced Zainab to go on her camel. You know what they did, what their plan was? They put Sakina on the camel back and they tied her arms and legs around the camel. They tied the camel and they tied the hands and legs around the belly of the camel. So now when the camel was riding, Sakina's chest was on the mane of the camel. You know the camel mane hair? They are strong hair. When they were riding to the next stop, Sakina would not scream. Because you know after she saw Hussein, Sakina stopped crying. She stopped looking at anything. They couldn't hear Sakina scream in pain. But when Sakina went to the other stop, her blood came out from her chest. It was bleeding. And the mane of the camel was filled with her blood. She was injured in such a way that when she died in charm and the person giving the whistle, the lady who gave the whistle, when she saw Sakina's chest, she said, who abused this child so much? That her injuries have taken inside her chest. Yeah, Hussein. 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 Yeah, Hussein.